there is a loss of access and there's a, a loss of those places that people used to go as children, places that hadn't been flooded, that were maybe mm -hmm. ponds, that were places where they played, places where they made memories, places where they fished during the 1960s, before the 1960s, Washington state game wardens would arrest tribal members for exercising their treaty rights. And there, there are memories of that resistance happening in those places along the river that don't exist anymore. Hey, hey, I'm Michael Yadrick. I'm an ecological restoration practitioner living on Puyallup Territory, now known as Tacoma, Washington. This is Tree Hugger Podcast, where we discuss both the success and ongoing challenges with the largest dam removal in history. We are taking you to the western edge of Turtle Island and the wild river called the Elwa that now flows unencumbered from the snow fields of the Olympic Mountains down to the Strait of Juan de Fuca, which is the Salish Sea gateway to the Pacific Ocean. This is one of my favorite topics, tearing down obsolete gray infrastructure and colonial artifacts in the spirit of restoration. I will acknowledge this story is pretty well covered, so I am going to skip much of the background and context about the project. I am both assuming you know something about it or can imagine the reasons behind the removal of the dams. There is a documentary from 2014 called The Return of the River that covers the drama and the story. There are also a few podcasts I would recommend. Charismatic Chris Morgan did an episode on The Wild in February of 2020. Then, my future friends at Future Ecologies also did an episode in late 2018, which also delves into the future of the Klamath Dan removals. So on this episode, I'm happy to introduce you all to my guest, Whitney Maurer, who is Assistant Professor of Environmental Studies at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Her work and research crosscuts environmental studies, rural and development sociology, and indigenous and American Indian studies. At the heart of Dr. Maurer's work are questions surrounding how environmental issues intersect with inequality in stratification, community, and development. She is broadly interested in understanding how indigenous conceptions, articulations, and practices of community development and well-being are shaped by relations of power and the physical structuring and restructuring of place. Her current research is focused on a collaborative project with the Lower Elwha Clallam tribe. In this project and recently published papers, she unpacks the settler colonial origins of dam building and examines resilience frameworks for understanding indigenous experiences of ecological restoration. While Dr. Maurer is not a citizen of the Lower Eloa Clallam, she prioritizes reciprocity and respect when developing and conducting research in the community. Her research practices are influenced by the principles described in Linda Smith's 2012 Decolonizing Methodologies, which commits to the intellectual and political self-determination and well-being of indigenous peoples. As such, Dr. Maurer recognizes the exploitive history of research in indigenous communities and has worked to develop a research program that is engaged with indigeneity, increases the visibility of indigenous scholars, and co-constructs a research agenda with the community partners, in this case the Lower Eloa Clallam tribe. I'm glad to bring you this update and fresh perspective on large dam removals, justice, and restoration. By engaging with this sort of cross-discipline dialogue, there are many takeaways with implications for our practice. It also helps us be better human beings. It starts right here. Enjoy this conversation with Whitney Maurer. Hello. Hi. How's it going? All right. How are you? We're good. Good morning. Good morning. So, Whitney, thank you for joining me today. Welcome to Tree Hugger Podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Could you give us a sense of, of who you are? And I was curious about when your first, if you recall your first trip to the Elwa and what sort of sparked your interest in, in research into the Elwa restoration or the people of the lower Elwa clan Elwha tribe. Well, so I've been, I've been interested in this restoration for 
a long time. So the the act to restore the river was passed in the early 90s. And I was a student at University of Puget Sound in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's probably when I first heard about that and was interested in the restoration itself. But I was particularly interested because I knew that there was uh, a tribe there. So I grew up in Oklahoma. My mother worked for years for Sac and Fox and Iowa tribe, and she did tribal repatriation and administration. And my father, he worked in doing drilling, like drilling water wells, test wells to test for pollution. So I had this dad who was doing this environmental work. And I had this mother who was doing work with tribes and I sort of combined those interests and got really interested in indigenous environmental justice. So I guess I just decided to do what my parents did, but together. So I've been interested since I went to college and just kind of meandered my way into this as a career. So I, you know, I used to work for the Confederated Tribes of Kusla, Rumpqua, and Sayusla Indians in Oregon before I did my PhD work in development sociology. And it was at that time in my PhD work, I was actually my master's work, where I was, was really interested in issues of restoration. I was interested actually um, in the Miccosukee in Florida and also where well, I did not do any work with them, but I was also interested in the restoration at Elwha. And I thought this is my opportunity to do this, to follow up on this thing I got really interested in in college. And so around 2006 or seven is when I first went up to Elwha and did some initial work on the history of the damming. And then I went back seven years later when the dams were actually coming out. And that's when I started to do the research that has become the basis of my latest article. So in 2006, did you start to form relationships at that point in time? Yes. And, that's, and you, visited that's the, the, you visited the territory and all the sites? That's right. And I met, I met Robert Ellefson, who was doing, he was head up the, the tribes, or excuse me, the nation's restoration program. And so I, you know, I met with him and I met with some of his staff and I started to get to know people at uh, the National Park. So at that time, there was an anthropologist working there named Jacqueline Ray, who was very helpful in, in connecting me with some of the historical information. I also talked with some elders at the time, who were able to tell me about, not just about what they knew about the history of the Elwha River and the dammings, but also a little about their experiences in testifying to Congress before the Elwha Restoration Act was passed. And I personally, too, I was in college in the 90s and I at at Evergreen, and I remember making a trip up there and it was in a call, obviously it was like an ecology class. And I remember standing on like the precipice looking at the the lower dam and someone talking to us. Like it's all sort of a foggy dream right now, but just thinking how impossible it was. And it was just so novel to me that they would be thinking about taking a dam out, but it makes total sense now. I think a lot of people thought it was impossible. I mean, even up through it coming out, because it's it's the largest dam removal in U.S. history. It's unprecedented to take out uh, the colonial concrete that is of that size. Yeah, and you think gray infrastructure? I interrogate the 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 lifespan of gray infrastructure all the time now. It's just like <laughs> the people who are building it think it's going to last forever, but really, it's like it had a fairly short lifespan when you think of like the lifespan of a western red cedar sometimes you know? that's right and and most of the dams are right now um <laughs> are past their expiration date right. and the elwa dams are even older than uh, many of the dams across the u.s so i have high hopes for the the border wall with mexico like perhaps it could just it's not meant to last forever <laughs> can you provide some context for how the elwa dams came to be and then affected the tribal fishing rights and then really assisted with dispossession of the lower Elwha Clallam tribe from the land and the waters from where they originated. We do have to go back to colonial encounters. And this is maybe somewhat of an arbitrary start date. But if we look at 1855, that was when the Treaty of Point No Point was signed between the governor of the Washington Territory, Isaac Stevens, and the indigenous nations of the Olympic Peninsula. 
including mm-hmm. m- many Sklalem villages, the lower Elwha Klalem were part of that. It's also important to recognize that many of the signatories, indigenous signatories, were under quite a bit of duress to sign those treaties. And when that treaty was signed, it ceded the ter- many of the territories and then consolidated them into a very small reservation, which was for the lower Elwha Klalem, very, very far from where their actual villages were. And so what happened was that they resisted and persisted by staying in their territories. They remained along the Elwha River. And so from a colonial settler perspective, right, that was perceived as illegal. The the treaty, however, and, and the treaties of Washington with the indigenous nations guarantee fishing rights at quote, usual and accustomed areas. That means outside of outside of the reservation. So legally, according to the treaties, the tribes could fish in any of their usual and accustomed areas, which includes the Elwha River. And so the, the lower Elwha Klallam peoples, they continued to fish in their village sites. They continued to occupy their village sites. But the sessions from the treaty opened up the land to private ownership by settlers. And so those lands became occupied and settled by a number of settlers over over several years. And those were enabled by laws like several acts like the Donation Land Act and the Homestead Acts. And although some tribal members were able to get lands through the Homestead Acts, there were they had to pay taxes in order to keep them, which was proved to be quite a difficulty for many of them. And so a number of settlers just bought up those lands, settled them, and then would buy them from other settlers. And this is what happened, especially through one Canadian settler, Thomas Aldwell, who, along with some investors, just collected lands along the Elwha River. And it was always his intent to build dams for power. He envisioned large-scale power production. As soon as he saw, you said you've been there. So you've seen the scale of of the river and he's looking at it and thinking Niagara Falls style power production. And that was his intent was to get investors to buy up to make hydroelectric dams. And so it was, you know, this series of federal acts and dispossession of Lower Elwha Klallam that enabled those dams to be built in the first place. And there were virtually no avenues for Klallam peoples to affect change. And so that's sort of the, the beginning of assaults on their fishing rights. And, and it's a direct, both a direct and an indirect line. So the dams blocked fish passage. So there is the decimation of fish through that, but there's also, as settlers began to occupy that area, both recreational and commercial fishing started to put a significant amount of pressure on indigenous fishing resources. And that's not just true for the Klallam, but for indigenous nations throughout Washington state, as I'm sure you may be familiar. I know you're familiar with fish (laughs) pressures, but in the 1960s, competition for fish between indigenous fishers and non-indigenous fishers, both recreation and commercial, really came to a head over fishing rights, which were then reaffirmed through the 70s, through the Bolt decision. Between the dams and fishing pressures from settlement, you have this convergence of assaults on indigenous access to fish, which sort of blew up, especially in the 1960s. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) that's right. Yeah. And where I live, so I live on Puyallup territory. And when I was in high school, it's like Puyallup River was the center of direct action where, you know, Indians stood up for their rights and which led to the bold decision. And it like goes like boom, boom, boom. Seems very fairly linear, but there's this huge decades worth of history and context that led up to it. Yeah. And when I, when I did my interviews, when I talked with people about the restoration, one of the things that became clear to me was how much that activism of the fishing wars Mm -hmm. uh, period continues to affect the way people think and act around issues of of fishing rights and treaties today. So it was heavily influential with some of the members. And I think there was a lot of momentum built on that, that, that grew into the activism around dam removal in the 1980s in Mm -hmm. particular. Mm 
Do you recall during that time too, I think the American Indian movement was fairly active as well. Is there some history with that? I remember yes. actually probably some of my earliest reading about the American Indian movement was back in high school. There was like biography of Leonard Peltier. I remember <laughs> reading it and listening to a few other podcasts recently that kind of go into the history. They do talk about how how that movement served the tribes in the Dakotas and then sort of expanded out. But I don't know really how far the reach was. No, this was definitely part of the that of the era. And actually, the occupation of Alcatraz was part mm. of the American Indian movement right. as well. So th- it was, you know, movement around sovereignty and tribal sovereignty. So even though, it was, you know, it's happening at the same time as the civil rights era, the focus of American Indian civil rights is not to have rights in the same way that other minority groups are seeking rights, but rather to have tribal sovereignty reaffirmed. And the fish wars were about sovereignty, right? They were about the affirmation of indigenous sovereignty and indigenous rights. So it was part of that movement. And if, and some of the players, you know, some of the celebrity players who participated in, in the fish wars on indigenous rights side were part of that American Indian movement mm-hmm. as well. So the Elwa Dam removal is generally heralded as a large scale success of dam removal and river restoration. So it's almost like mythical in my profession (laughs) that, you know, we tore down the dams, the fish are coming back and all of a sudden this cultural connection is also restored. Can you give us some depiction of some of the ongoing challenges faced by the lower Elwa Klallam tribe since the dam removals? I think it is, you're right, it's largely a success, and and we should recognize that it's a su- success, but th- such successes don't just happen, and then everything is fixed and wonderful and perfect, and restoration takes work, right? It's not, you don't take dams out, and then everything is magically back to where it was at some arbitrary point in time. <laughs> and so some of the some of the challenges that are ongoing are how to how to keep the restoration going, how to continue managing the return of fish populations. The fish aren't just returning. There's work by uh, biologists that is happening, tribal fishery staff who are working to maintain fish populations. There's not funding allocated for that. So all of the funds for the restoration have been allocated. And the Lower Elwha Kalam tribe is often seeking more funds from the federal government to maintain that. I don't think they even have a restoration office anymore. So financially, this is an ongoing thing that needs to be supported. And that's certainly been a problem for the tribal government. But there are other things as well. So the success of this restoration has created a lot of interest. A lot of scientists are really interested in it, but a lot of tourists are also interested in it. And so people have started visiting the reservation and trying to get to the river and going to the new beach. So a beach has has emerged because of this restoration, a very large beach over 80 acres of sand that wasn't there before. And so a lot of people are visiting it. And this is a nation. This is their territory. It is not public access. And so how to manage visitors, there there really aren't, there wasn't preparation for the sort of influx of visitors and how to manage that. And even the river itself. So there was a road that went to the river that before the restoration, people could go to it. They would fish off of it. You could go swimming there. But that has been washed away. The end of that was washed away when the restoration happened. So when the waters were released and there's sort of a barrier up, but you could walk there, like a person could walk there. And it's dangerous now because the waters are unpredictable and they're much faster than they were when the dams were up. And someone actually died at at the river there. And so there are concerns about, you know, if visitors are coming, are they going to try to get to the water? Could this be dangerous for people? There could be potential crime. There's a lot of trash on the beach. Whether that's coming from visitors, I can't say. But when I was there, there were, there were like people had constructed, uh, tribal members had constructed sort of little makeshift little sitting areas that were little covered areas where people could hang out, maybe, you know, spend time with friends, family, 
but there had also been clearly had been fires and there were signs that people had just posted themselves that said tribal land, no fires. So there were concerns about whether visitors were starting fires or even whether members of the community were behaving in ways that were irresponsible or potentially damaging or dangerous. So there's a number of unanticipated things that have to be dealt with now from a safety perspective, from an administrative perspective, that maybe everybody just wasn't prepared for because who knew that they would gain 80 acres of beach. And, and I understand I, that there's some flooding as well along the river, like it it floods now, right? The dam sort of controlled waters, but now it's like, it's wild. Right. There has always been flooding. So that has been an ongoing problem was that there was flooding. And in fact, some of the some of the stories that I heard from elders were fascinating about talking about seasons when their homes would be flooded because there were homes right along the river. So there has always been some flooding and there was a levee built before the restoration ever happened. That levee had to be increased in in size and strength. But what that also meant was that because of course, as you said, you remove the the dams and the river is set free, right? And, and so there's more widespread flooding and more constant flooding. And the project itself required that everybody move out of that flood zone area. And so the dynamics of flooding have changed. And even though people used to live in these flooded areas before, now n- nobody is occupying them. And as I said, it can be dangerous it means that there's not really access to the river in the same way that there was before. So the way that people may have accessed it in their childhood, gathering foods or going for recreational reasons, you know, the river was much calmer. And so people accessed it more. And now it's much more formally inaccessible. And of course, there are reasons for it, but that also means that there's a loss, right? There is a loss of access and there's a a loss of those places that people used to go as children, places that hadn't been flooded, that were maybe Mm -hmm. ponds, that were places where they played, places where they made memories, places where they fished. During the 1960s, before the 1960s, Washington State game wardens would arrest tribal members for exercising their treaty rights. Mm -hmm. And there, there are memories of that resistance happening in those places along the river that don't exist anymore. So for all the good that this restoration brings, there's also some sadness about the loss of those sites that are so imbued with memories and Mm -hmm. memories of childhood, memories of resistance. Mm. I imagine for the majority of folks, actually everyone, right? I don't know if even elders recall the time, except the story of when the dam didn't exist, right? Like the river has always been a certain way. That's right. I don't think there are any elders left who were alive before the dams were built. The first one was built in 1910 and mm-hmm. um, the other was built in the early 1920s. So I don't know if there's anybody, if they are alive, that I don't think there is anybody who's alive. Yeah, uh, they would be very long lived for sure. <laughs> that's right. So they've, yeah. they've, they've grown up on a dammed river, mm-hmm. right? So you have generations of people who have grown up on this dammed river. And, will, and may never experience the truly undammed river in the way that they're hopeful that future generations will. Yeah, and I understand. I think there are plans, I would say, in other places, at least in the U.S., dam construction is still ongoing in some places. Maybe they're not like big Grand Coulee-sized dams, but little like baby dams. But other countries, too, are still engaging in green option of hydroelectric power. It may not be totally appropriate for us to talk about how the Elwa projects flooded out some sacred sites, but access to those sacred sites is is removed as well when some of these dams occur. That's right. And what I can say about the Elwa, I can't say where a sacred site is, but there was a a sacred site, a creation site that was inundated with floodwaters that is now theoretically accessible not exactly accessible because not everybody, not every member knows where it is or how to get to it. And many can't just physically, it would not be safe for them to try to access it. Okay. So were some of these issues unforeseen during the planning for dam removal or were they concerns not addressed during the design 
So I would say that some of them were addressed like the flooding from the levees and they were addressed in that they knew this was going to happen and they were designing ways to protect people's safety against it. What I think was unaddressed is compensation for the loss of land because it's technically, right, the land is still part of the lower Elwha Klallam reservation, but before the dams were removed, that would have been developable land that the that the government could have used for buildings or housing. And, and now there's a lot less developable land for the tribe. And so some compensation or expansion of the of the reservation to provide for housing was really not part of the restoration package. And there's a section of land between the National Park and the Lower Elwha Columns uh, Reservation that had to be obtained by the federal government in order to make the restoration happen. And that, that land is still in limbo. And I know there was hope from the tribe the tribal government's perspective that those lands would be returned right those were their those were their historic ancestral lands and so i know there was some hope that would be returned i don't know what the status is at this point as far as i understand it's still kind of in a state of limbo and, and again those wouldn't be developable lands but that's kind of not the point <laughs> in terms of them having that returned there was a there was a hope or uh, that it would be part of their land base. The developable piece is a different kind of separate issue. Mm -hmm. And actually there's a related piece to the flooding that I don't think was anticipated. They anticipated that the flooding would affect sewage systems because many of the homes were, I think most of the homes were on septic. And so they had to convert the system to hook up to the city sewer. And part of that was paid for. And part of that became the financial burden of the residents. And we're talking about many people who are on a fixed income and a pretty substantial increase, which may not look like a lot to others, but to people on a fixed income, a fairly substantial increase in monthly payments for just sewer and water. And so those types of unanticipated burdens on an already low income, high rates of poverty community is incredibly problematic, right? It just increases those differential burdens on this group of people. Mm -hmm. And there's no real subsidy built into like the larger project to help offset those costs, right? So there, a, there was, there was, but not okay. enough to cover the full cost. Okay, And so part of that burden, part of that subsidy is being provided, even the subsidy that's benefiting the residents is being provided by the tribe itself. And so the tribe is taking on a pretty substantial burden for for an environmental problem that they never created in the first place, right? So the, the burden that has been placed on the Lower Elwha Klallam tribe for the restoration of damming that they were neither responsible for nor did they want part of this settler colonial structure that continues to disadvantage Indigenous nations. In a lot of your writing, you really interrogate this concept of resilience, and mm -hmm. it's really this term that's it's used in restoration, too, in ecology, and it's used in social sciences as well. And, you know, to a certain extent, I agree with you, or I think this is your assertion that it's really, it's kind of overused to the point that it loses its meaning. So in ecology, it refers to systems' ability to withstand disturbance or degradation and their capacity to really bounce back to what their original like assemblage or robustness in production, you know, things like that. So in your work, how does the literature represent this term and what might be more precise language to use in regards to the, to the lower Elwha Klallam experience? That is a question I think my work is trying to grapple with, and I'm not sure I have an, a, a great answer for it yet, because I'm still exploring it, as are many of my colleagues in Indigenous environmental studies. The, the term has a lot of conceptual ambiguity, and I think the reason for that ambiguity is that it's, it is so used in so many different disciplines. It's also used colloquially. I'm, it's all people are talking about right now, right in response to the pandemic, how can we be resilient or look at the resilience of people who have gone through such horrors? 
It's used a lot in a lot of different contexts, and it's been adopted by social scientists from ecology to think about how social systems can be adaptable in the face of potential ecological changes. So it's especially in terms of natural disasters and climate change. So not just how our our ecological systems can be resilient, but how those socio-ecological systems can respond and maintain functionality, right? So you don't want your system to collapse in the event of a climate event or increase in global temperatures. So it's being used a lot to think about how social and ecological systems interact. The shortcomings of that kind of bounce back approach when you're talking about social systems, it involves the privileging of sort of a place in time and the and what the social systems looked like at a particular point in history. So any kind of resilience approach to social development tends to privilege whatever point in time you're defining um, the social system. So if you're looking at bouncing back to something, right, and you're trying to say, how can we, how can we make sure that our systems are adaptable so that we can go back to the way things were in the event of a natural disaster, that assumes that the way things were is better than how they could be in the future. And I think that's a major shortcoming when we're talking about indigenous peoples or really any marginalized group or any group that is experiencing uh, a system that is not working for them, right? So it, it closes out futures. It closes out other ways of imagining social change. So the the shortcoming of a a resilience-based approach to social systems is that we're not looking at how to adapt and then imagine something new and something better that we want. So the word or the term to capture that, I'm not quite sure of yet. There is a citizen Potawatomi, an environmental philosopher, Kyle White, who's at uh, University of Michigan, and he writes a lot about indigenous resilience and some of the things that he has pointed to that could be helpful in rethinking these concepts are moral relationships, spirituality, accountability, responsibility, and including those in, I mean, imagine this, including those things in ecological restoration projects, right? So that we're not just looking at ecological restoration as reversing time to create what an ecosystem might have looked like a hundred years ago, but how do we reimagine the social relationships that go with that restoration in ways that make us accountable both to the natural world and to the social worlds in which we inhabit. Exactly. And I think, yeah, we're definitely in in restoration too. There is this existential debate really about how restoration often from its inception intends to anchor us in the past, right? It's continually ongoing. And I don't know if you've heard about this concept of like novel ecosystems and how things just plant associations, they just they're emerging, you know, with like global trade and global environmental change, just things are changing. So like anchoring into the past isn't always the, the best way to do it. So how we negotiate that is still up for a lot of debate. So I guess given what you've seen and heard, do you think there are specific ways that restorationists can incorporate cultural resurgence or honor tribal sovereignty better? Yes. And I think that the major way to do that is to have Indigenous peoples be decision makers. So not not just consultants, that, mm-hmm. but actually part of decision making process, incorporating Indigenous knowledges into restoration practices. There were some really interesting things that were done at Elwa on the Elwa River. And that was that when I talked to fisheries staff, they had interviewed tribal members, and they knew about where the different villages were. So they knew where the the historic fishing villages were. And so when they created log jams, so they were creating log jams to help the fish have places to rest on their way upstream. And they knew so that the historic villages were always located at sites where fish typically used to rest, right? And so they created the log jams there. So they're using these 
they're communicating with the community, right? In order to not only restore, but to think about how that restoration reflects cultural history. And, and that's just one little tiny example. But there are ways right, to incorporate Indigenous knowledges into restoration practice, and not just Indigenous knowledge, but having tribal governments, having knowledge bearers, having decision makers from the community as part of the planning process. I think it's it's incredibly important, right? That's part of sovereignty. If you're if you're not part of the decision making, if you don't get to have a say, then you are not getting to enact your sovereignty. That's good advice for folks hopefully listening. <laughs> I'm trying to think of some other projects that are ongoing. I don't know if you are so kind of laser focused on the Elwa restoration. If you're, if you have your eyes on your radar is on other restoration projects and seeing writing on the wall as they go through the, the planning process. What I'm going to start looking into, so my next sort of plan, I'm hoping to start in looking into this in the fall, is to look at dam removals more generally and see where they're happening, how many are happening on reservation or trust lands, and then see if I can figure out the processes by which those dams have been removed and the extent of involvement of Indigenous nations in those removals. And I, and I know that there are some in particular happening or conversations around them happening in Maine. One just came out at Akwesasne Mohawk just a few years ago. I'd love to find out more about how many dam removals are being directed by, or other restoration projects are being directed by the community itself. Yeah, that's interesting. And I'm thinking of like how the electricity market is changing and how we generate electricity is changing, you know, moving perhaps more towards like solar, Mm -hmm. these other technologies, and then making dams obsolete, more uh, more and more obsolete, right? And which may trigger this this series of potentially ill-conceived dam removal projects are rushing to do the benevolent thing, which is like, appears to be removing the dam so we can restore nature and culture. But probably because the state is involved and in, uh, it could result in more land grabs and, right. <laughs> bad, and just bad stuff, right? You know, that's part of what makes this so complicated is that, mm. you know, obviously anything that goes through FERC is federal level and the optics of it are restore it. The Klallam will get their culture back. Look at all the good we've done. Mm. And yet on the ground, right on the ground, the reality is quite different. Culture doesn't just come back, just like the restoration itself physically has to be constantly enacted over the the next 30 years. You have to replant. You have to work to bring the fish back. They don't, they're not just coming back. There's that there are biologists at work making it happen. They're dropping fish places Mm -hmm. to make sure that they're being repopulated, Mm -hmm. but cultural restoration and resurgence is work. It takes work to bring a culture, not back, but forward and uh, that's, you know, that's what Indigenous peoples and Lower Elwha Klallam are looking forward to, right? It's not just the bringing back of culture, but the bringing forward of culture. Culture is dynamic. Culture is adaptable. They have persisted, resisted, survived, and renewed in spite of the dams. But it takes work and it takes resources to make that continue and for it to be what they want it to be. And the way that these restorations are happening, the way this restoration happened, it didn't provide for that. It was sort of the assumed that it would just bounce back, right? You take the dams out, fish return, culture's back. And and that's a simplistic way of looking at cultural resurgence and renewal. That's good stuff. I focused before today, I would say I focused so much of my, any of my attention on the Elwa restoration has been focused on the vegetation, right, of the reservoir and thousands and thousands of plants went in there. And the last presentation I saw on it was like a few years back. And I was, I was curious, like you said about the process, like it just doesn't stop with the dam removal itself. And we think about restoration as an ongoing process. Sometimes funding doesn't last as long or we don't build a timeline out that accommodates the process because you think right. this area was dammed for like X amount of years and just like overnight, it's just not going to change. It takes perhaps like an equal amount of time to really, well, 
if we are get back to what it was or and then um, trying to negotiate what it's going to be in the future. So like if these cultural practices, like with the forest, if the cultural practices aren't incorporated now moving forward in managing the revegetation, because a lot of times crews go in there and we just plant, 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 plant what we assume is natural or what's going to provide erosion control or habitat. But moving forward, that's a very young forest. That's And really the forests that we originally were gifted had centuries worth of tending and cultural practices, which helped to bring them to be. So, and largely on park national park service land, there is not that level of access to right. those traditional practices. So now I'm very skeptical of our type of stewardship that we that we carry out. And it's more like recreation. And and more and more we're starting to realize that there is the things that we don't know that we don't know and bringing in indigenous communities and really partnering with them can be so crucial to realigning our values and hopefully reviving culture and language along the way. So kind of wrapping up, I, there's a few questions I ask everyone. One is it's pretty easy is what your favorite tree is. My favorite tree is the magnolia that was in my front yard growing up. Mm. Uh, that was my absolute favorite tree. I still think about that tree because we don't have magnolias of that size yeah. here in New York. But that was the tree I always used to climb because it had such like wide, thick, low branches and I could get pretty high up to my mother's dismay. And unfortunately, that tree no longer exists mm. because the people who bought our childhood home cut it down. Wow. And it breaks my heart to know that that tree is gone because it provided hours of playtime. Right. I hope it was a hard decision to remove it for them. I don't know. It's such a, it seems like those are such beloved trees. Like they're just cherished and they're very expensive to buy too and replace. I, I mean, they're just I such a showy, showy flowers and they're just sacred. Yeah. Agreed. All right. We can get off that topic then. It brings up bad, <laughs> brings up bad memories. The other thing is, you know, one of the reasons behind the podcast was engender some trust or give advice, I guess, for folks to the next generation of either restorationists. But in your case, like as a professor, you see a lot of students come through. Would you have any advice for people who would want to either study or engage in the sort of scholarship that you're into? Let's see. I'll, I'll, let me think about this in terms of how I, I think about it with my students. Mm -hmm. My students are largely non-Indigenous. And so what I like to do with those students, a lot of them are, are in, they're environmental studies majors who might be interested in conservation or restoration. And so what I try to, to do with them is help them understand history and social structure and even if they are scientists who don't think they're interested in those things, helping them understand the intersection of the type of work that they want to do or they think they're going to do and the social structure and history and why it matters today, right? So helping them think about those linkages between social science and politics, social position and ecological practice or conservation practice and management. So it, to me, any kind of science should be in conversation with other disciplines and science or social science should also be in conversation with scientific disciplines. Do you know Carrie Norgard's work? Oh, She's that's from, a new one for me. So you, you'll like it. Okay. So she's at University of Oregon. She also works with Indigenous Nations. On, she has written this book. So Norgard's work also with Indigenous peoples, it brings her to writing about things like climate change. She's a sociologist, an environmental sociologist. And she has, she has this article, I actually have my students read it. And it's about having an uh, a sociological imagination in a time of climate change. And she makes this call for social scientists of all kinds to have more of an ecological imagination, meaning understanding the interconnectedness of all things. And for 
scientists to have more of a sociological imagination, which is thinking about the relationship between individual and individual issues and and personal problems and larger social structures. And so she, this is one of the things I start out with it with my students in our social science core class for environmental studies majors is how can you develop both an ecological imagination and a sociological imagination? And why is it important to have both of those things if you're going to do work in the area of environmental studies or sciences? So I guess that would be my advice to those is to, to develop both your ecological and your sociological imagination to make those connections across ecological and social systems and understand how the local and the personal is connected to larger social structure and ecological structure. That is good advice. Just sounds like you're helping, helping us be real human beings, right? <laughs> using our full brains and just not all being, related. Yeah, <laughs> just not living in our bubbles, but being able to be transdisciplinary, but also work with some empathy. Right. I like yeah. that work with empathy. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been lovely. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you and so much. I really think you've provided some excellent perspective on this dam restoration, which has become mythical <laughs> in so many ways. And I think this is a story that is worth listening to. Thanks for finding Tree Hugger Podcast again and tuning into this discussion with Whitney Maurer. Please take the listener survey if you can. One can find the link right now in the show description in your app, the Tree Hugger website, or the Tree Hugger Instagram profile. There are just a few questions about preferred length of the episodes, where you found me, your desires, and what you might dislike about the show. That's it. And if you submit something and drop your mailing address, I will send you a Tree Hugger sticker. I have another announcement for you all. I'm about one month away from winter's end here. As the weather starts to warm up, one can expect to hear a little less from Tree Hugger as the winter podcasting season, I just made that up, comes to an end. I'm getting a little soft, so I will be outside way more and not in front of the computer editing. However, I will not disappear completely. I am going to hold out for some safe in-person interviews. I have a whole stack of books to read. I'm going to spend some time with my family and I have some running to do too. I have my sights set on running around my local volcano before wildfire smoke sets in this summer. A big 93-mile lap around the Wonderland Trail of Tahoma, otherwise known as Mount Rainier. So a couple more shows before I go off the grid. Thanks for joining me again for another episode of Tree Hugger Podcast. I'm Michael Yadrick. Please check out the show description for more information about Whitney Maurer. Or you can find out more about her online at treehuggerpod.com. We are on social media at TreeHuggerPod, so feel free to point people in our direction. Subscribe, rate, and review the show, please, on whichever podcast platform you enjoy listening to. It helps people find the show. Or tell a friend about the show. Music for the show was from Reed Mathis and MK2. Thanks for hanging out.